barren sands may stretch for hundreds of miles, with dunes nearly 500 feet high. The desert winds blow the constantly shifting waves. Here nothing can grow, and neither man nor animal can live for long. In modern times, man has built railways along the edge of the Sahara, but the railway lines reach only a few hundred miles into the desert. Some roads cross the Sahara, but they are of poor quality. In some places, piles of rock are needed to help mark. Emergency stations have been built to provide petrol lonely towns of the desert. Aeroplanes carry passengers and cargo swiftly over the dunes and mountains, covering in hours a distance that would take many days by car or train, and many months by camel or on foot. The desert city is there is usually a stream supplying farms and a palm grove. Wood is precious and most houses are made of earth. The clay near a water hole is mixed with sand and patted into cakes. The cakes, in drying, harden into bricks to reflect the sun, keep out the heat and make the houses comfortable changed for goods from other areas. Dates and cereals, in exchange for spices from Central Africa, sheep and goats from the northern mountains, or metal from Europe. Such goods are brought by trains, lorries and aeroplanes. But away from these cities are millions of square miles of desert. To reach such remote areas, man must use the only beast of burden which can live well in the desert, the camel. The camel's wide, flat feet do not sink into desert sand. It eats hay or straw, but can live equally well on desert grasses. It can close its nostrils against blowing sand. Though ugly, ill-tempered and hard to train, the camel is the most valuable animal in the desert. A camel can travel five or six days without water, in conditions which would soon kill a horse or an ox. It can cover 50 miles a day with a rider or a load of 500 pounds. Camel caravans are still the only means of carrying food and supplies to the remote tribes. At the foot of mountain slopes, where occasional rains collect, there are sometimes grassy plains where goats or sheep can graze. But soon the thin grass is eaten and the flocks must move on, perhaps many miles, to find another pasture. The people who tend these wandering flocks, people with no permanent homes, are called nomads. A small caravan of camels may carry a family of nomads and all their belongings. Here, enough grass has been found to give a few days grazing to the flocks, so camp is made. The nomad's tent is a strange house, but an extremely practical one, for it must often be moved and can be rolled up and carried on the back of a camel. The coarsely woven material helps to keep out blowing sand, and the tent, being low and rounded, offers little resistance to the strong desert wind. The family's water bags are hung on a tripod. Coffee is ground with a brass and pestle. Apart from this, the nomads cooking were fuel pots and pans and wooden bowls for mixing food. Wool from the flocks is carded between wooden paddles in which hundreds of projecting nails comb the raw wool into parallel strands. The fibers are twisted to form a cord and are attached to a wooden bobbin. Spinning the bobbin tightens the strands into yarn, which may be woven into blankets, tents or clothing. 
The nomad's wealth is in his flocks and the meat and wool which they produce. Scattered widely through the desert are springs or groups of wells called oases. Here men can live, cultivate fields and build a village. The oasis may grow a profusion of vegetables, grains, fruits and flowers. An important oasis crop is grain. It is harvested by hand and may be threshed by camels walking on the grain the pressure of their feet, squeezing the kernels from the husk. At an oasis market, nomad tribes may stop to exchange their meat and wool products for the fruit and grains of the oasis farm. The palm tree is very important in the desert. In the summer, a palm grove may give the only shade within miles. Dead palm leaves are carefully gathered, for without them, desert dwellers would have difficulty in finding fuel for cooking. The palm tree provides logs for the rafter and leaves for the roof. Date palms provide food. Boys climb the trees carrying the blossoms of other date palms. They sprinkle the pollen from these blossoms onto the tree's flowers, which are then tied into bunches to hold the pollen. This artificial pollination is necessary because natural pollination would produce few dates. In a few months, the seeds ripen into rich clusters of fruit. In this hot land, dates can be dried and kept indefinitely without refrigeration. The number of people a village can support depends upon the amount of food which can be raised on the nearby farm. For even in an oasis, man has a constant struggle with nature. His whole existence may depend upon the slender thread of a tiny stream or well, which may dry up and take life with it. The source of such water may be rainfall on mountain slopes hundreds of miles away. The water, seeping deep underground, may rise to the surface of a tiny spring, run as a stream for a few miles, and then soak into the desert. In other areas, water comes from deep artesian wells. In some wells, fine sand may filter through spaces in the rock walls and collect at the bottom. In time, this will stop the flow of water. The dangerous task of keeping such wells free from sand falls to these divers. The diver holds on to a guide rope which leads to the bottom. Then, understanding the hazards of such diving, he says a prayer. An assistant brushes away the flies so that they will not disturb the diver. The diver now fills his lungs and pulls himself to the bottom by means of the guide rope. Three long minutes pass before there is a swirl in the water and the exhausted man reappears, gasping for air. Assistants rub his shoulders to restore circulation. And the diver goes to a fire of palm branches to warm after the chilling depth. Helpers pull a rope from the well. A sand-filled basket comes to the surface, filled by the bare hands of the diver in the cold and dark pressure of a hundred-foot depth.
Such men risk their lives many times a day to ensure that the precious water shall continue to flow. Without water holes and oases, this would be a barren land where man could not live. Man has crossed the Sahara with roads and rails. Plains and lorries carry goods to cities a thousand miles from what we call civilization. Yet, despite modern man's knowledge, the Sahara remains a region of rolling sand dunes and rocky plains. where life depends on a hidden well, where a seeping pool of water gives life to an oasis. The people of the Sahara have a hard, uncertain life, where a whim of nature may destroy their water source, blot out their farms, and sow their existence.